invited here to contribute to um, a couple of thoughts for your day, for our day together. And uh, this title from systems engineering to system sensing is um, maybe a bit provocative. And um, I want to start with saying I'm also a systems engineer. So I'm very much part of what we're doing together here. And I'm starting this little morning note with this AI generated images. We all use AI. AI is, of course, a quite an important topic also when it comes to complexity and how we enact complexity, how we enact systems. And this is uh, prompted, um, I guess, many of you using AI as a daily tool, but this represents a little bit some of what I want to talk about today. It's one side, the systems engineering component he said a bit in black and white and a bit over uh, exaggerated, but it's the kind of engineering, the solid engineering of complicated infrastructures, for example, like bridges, our topic, bridges. And on the other side, there's the organicness of living systems, of biology-based systems, which are fundamentally unpredictable. And we are trying to dance within both, the kind of more rigid, solid engineering of complex or complicated systems and the kind of enacting of these more organic systems where also the human factor plays a bigger role and AI as well. So how does this feel? How can we sense these dichotomies? And I wanted to ask you if you could, um, this should be displayed here. <laughs> Yeah, that's also emergence, so it's not displayed here. But anyway, if you um, want to take your phone and go to this, um, scan this code just for a minute, and uh, go to this, uh, type in this event code, then we could have a quick activation. And I'm wondering what terms or questions come in mind when you hear this notion from systems engineering to system sensing. Maybe that's a bit provocative. Maybe you came with a certain picture saying, what do they want from me? <laughs> so if you just want to type in um, a couple of keywords, and this should obviously work. Let's see why this doesn't work. Oh, here we go. I mean, so we do it this way. So yeah, just collecting a bit of keywords, it can be a question, um, maybe something you feel provoked a bit. Um, maybe have a aspect that you find interesting. Um, and we're just following a bit what's happening here in this aspect complexity. We're seeing connecting the dots, insights versus information. Uh, should be seamless, that integration. Oh, that's good. I like that. Should be seamless. Deep learning. Life cycle assessment, yes, uh, we have some over-engineering, oh good. Mm. Control versus collaboration, holistic approach. Oh, I'm thinking of a very informed audience here, that's beautiful. Reducing complexity in harmony with nature, CO2 neutral. So there's a lot of information. Thank you so much for this little start here. We're gonna do that again at the end of our little thing. And we're gonna preserve this artwork uh, and share later on. So let's see what comes out. Great. Okay. Let's go back. So my little storyline that I brought here for this 45 minutes about is first a bit of a system thinking recap, because I was here last night for a kind of drink, just to sense a bit, sensing the system. I could engineer it. I could engineer my talk already by the information I was given but I need to sense it because there's the nuances that I cannot read. I have to sense it. So I talked to a couple of colleagues and I sensed it makes sense to bring in some systems thinking recap, which was emergent little last night after the event here. Um, then I want to talk a bit about emergence in complex system and understand a bit the differences between complicated and complex. There was also a bit of a discussion last night. So I picked it up. And then we are tapping a bit into this from systems engineering to sensing, the building bridges topic. I think there's beautiful analogies in here. And at the end, we wanna walk our way all the way to a concrete learning offer. 
So let's start with a systems thinking recap. And I love this picture. I've been using it for really 20 years. Um, and this is just a notion that we can't just split something in parts and look at these parts individually and put them together. That's not a system. It needs to have elements, relations, or connections, and a purpose. The question often comes if a heap of sand is a system. It has elements. It maybe has some kind of relation in terms of friction of the sand crystals. I'm not sure if it's purpose. It is to be discussed. That's also an old discussion. Is a heap of sand a system? And then systems thinking, and these are important concepts. And Friedrich Capra, um, icon in system thinking, and part of our DRS course at ETH, mentioned this way of thinking in terms of relationships, in terms of patterns, connectedness, and in terms of context. The context matters a lot. So does the heap of sand have context? Question. And we're tapping right in complex doesn't equal complicated. And it's not so easy to distinguish, but if we look at the literature, then complicated is more these kind of infrastructures or machines or technological elements that consist of many parts, but with smart data, smart tools, we can put them together and engineer them. Highly structured, complicated. Complex on the other side are dynamic, emergent, fuzzy. There's human behavior, there's unpredictability. Living systems are fundamentally unpredictable. So if something is complicated, we usually also refer to us people. <laughs> but the sense is more complex in this case. So complicated systems, yes, we can engineer them. Complex system, rather not. And these unintended consequences are also one of these beautiful um, sketches that somebody made, uh, and they are very useful to say, yes, we do something, but we don't think what comes back to us. It's a kind of feedback loop. So these complex systems have feedback loops. Positive, negative, they steer and control somehow the system, but it's unintended. So complicated can be engineered. That's the system we engineer, complex, need to be sensed. That's a big difference. And then there are many types of systems. We discussed it yesterday a bit. What, kind, what is a system? What kind of systems? Biological systems, social systems. Our conference is social system, mechanical systems. But we mostly refer to socio-technical systems. There's a whole community of, of research on transitions, on change in socio-technical systems and social uh, ecological systems. There's more the transformation term that's used. So it's really different communities eventually doing similar things. So I'll give, a, I'll give an example. Um, emergence in complex systems, what that means. So we have this... Um, real world laboratory, as we call it, a living system lab in the Italian Piemont Mountains, which we have been building up since almost 10 years. It's a place to experiment in complexity, something we cannot do at universities. It's the real world, it's unpredictable. Things happen that we cannot control on purpose. So we immerse ourselves in these spaces and places and bring people, and we're growing hemp. This is hemp, uh, industrial hemp. of the first ever hemp composite skis. These were built with engineering students at ETH Zurich. And you can see the hemp fibers here. You can see uh, recycled polyethylene. Uh, you can see different types of wood. And you can have a bio-based epoxy um, that can be separated. And, and the whole thing is very circular. So it's the most eco-friendly ski that ever existed at that time in terms of high standards. And it's a hemp composite. It's truly complicated to make it. Because hemp, we grew that hemp ourselves. This kind of pre prac doesn't exist for hemp, so it's difficult. And the outcome is still a bit unpredictable. So it's at the edge of being uh, complex. What could this be? Someone throwing a keyword? Bearing, compression, high compression strength, insulation material for building wall systems. So this is hemp shives. These are the inner, um, the kind of wooden part of the hemp plant, whereas the fibers are outside, the sheath, and the, the wooden parts are inside. So this is a lot of air inside. And what's standard is culture canapa, hempcrete, hemp and lime for an insulation material. But they're not load-bearing. So we were wondering at ETH, 
if we can develop an insulating load-bearing material based on hemp using geo geopolymer, metacarline. And it works. It's developed. So it's engineered, that system. Why are we not using it? Technically, it works quite well. One thing, it's too expensive. It used to be too expensive. So when we go from these concrete, technically engineered examples, which all work best other skis, 50%. Could just easily do it, right? Systems engineering. This is part of what we need to do. So this is transforming an entire complex system with nested systems inside. The ski with the fibers, um, the building material, hemp fabric, like this pant, this hemp pant here, these are all technical elements that we can engineer, but they are part of the system. And the building material, this one, is too expensive because we only look at that building material. We engineer it, but we don't look at all the interactions in the entire hemp system which we try to do. So this hemp system has at least eight kind of decision-making scales. And the building is up on the fourth on the left, that's the building scale, and the raw materials products. So this is what we're talking about. But they are part of a system where we have to have a landscape change. We have to include the farmers. <clears throat> and we call this a kind of complex system that is continuously moving. It's a system that changes shape all the time. If you try to grab it in one discipline, one ski, one building material, that might technically be the solution. It's not, because dependent on all the other factors. If you want to transition and make this hemp building material mainstream, we need to address the entire system, understand what is the culture of young farmers being trained in Switzerland to grow hemp. And I learned from Strickhoff from the kind of top um, agricultural school north of Zurich, that young farmers apparently coming with this notion, the spirit to earn money from the green land. Hemp is not in the topic. So we need to bring it into the culture. Otherwise, that, that technical system that we're developing here, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. But that's what we're doing. We focus on this one, and then we are excited. Oh, it's too expensive. Nobody uses it. Yes, because we don't employ all the other elements by also putting in the agricultural side, subsidies, direct payments, by using the health aspects, CBD of the blossoms, using the protein of the seeds to make milk um, and, and flour and oil, using fabrics, using fabrics for composite materials like wind mills, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a very systemic view, and that's what we're trying to do here and to model. And the real world laboratory in the center, that's the kind of the institute we built to experiment within these complexities. So let's skip it further, from systems engineering to systems sensing. So I said in the beginning, I consider myself a systems engineer somewhat too. I come from forest and uh, engineering and, and wood and, and buildings. Uh, I built skis, these skis that you saw I built with the hands. So it's not the theory of doing it, of talking about it, it's doing it actually, it's embodying it. And the term solutioneering is not my invention, but it's out there in this kind of discussion of our more Western oriented part of understanding science, understanding engineering, understanding solutions to a complex problem require better data, better models to work on. That's what we usually teach and what we are raised of. And that has strength, a lot of strength. Because if we think about an um, efficient system, the technology here today, everything works perfect. Right? Heat control, uh, ventilation, mobility this morning, that's properly engineered. And that requires rigid structural um, or different types of engineering, systems engineering at the end. So it's positive, to be frankly said. We need that. And that's great for complicated systems. But for complex systems, it's not enough. And we see here a couple of collections. It's very slow in terms of to adapt. It's not very flexible. It's rigid. It's a top-down hierarchy often, versus we know we need to have more dispersed kind of co-creation opportunities between the elements of a system that can have autopsy. It's standardized frameworks. The organicness or the organicity is missing. 
and we propose technical over human skills. So the better planable it is, the better contained it is, the more safe it feels. We people don't like uncertainty. It freaks us out. And maybe you think back whenever things get a bit messy, the future gets a bit messy, we try to have a better plan. And that helps in a moment. But we learn more and more that the better plan is only as good as the information this moment. So how do we deal with emergence in complex system? And I have here a little bit of a, a mini story that's a student of, of one of my course from the last year, and that's in the Monvisa Institute, a passive house. We call it passive net positive because we evolved the passive house standard to be more place specific, more organic, and more relate to the complexity of the system at place. And so he did, uh, um, um, he started integrated building systems, so kind of systems engineering course, and he did an energy model for that facade and the roof. So he modeled the entire building, how much energy can we uh, provide over the year, over the course of the sun in the mountain ranges, the shadow, et cetera, um, and how does it relate to the use of energy in that building? And he made that graph as part of his bigger report. And I took that graph only, I printed it, and I have it in our building up in the Italian mountains. And I used it many times to show to some of the architects or politicians or builders that we need to use the southern facade to produce electricity, energy, energy in general. It's not allowed there, it's against the building code. It's a traditional cultural building code, so don't touch the facade, have a stone facade. But we know we're dependent on energy from other countries. We have a, a war uh, in Europe and we are geopolitically dependent on Russia, for example in Italy, similar to Germany. So we need to take these spaces where we have eight hours of sunshine in mid-December in the shortest day of the year, but we're not allowed to. So I use this kind of model to show it to people. And it helped because it's not Tobias saying we need solar, it's a study that someone did from ETH. It's a tremendous help. It's a tool to nudge the system. It's a kind of systemic design tool. And I told this to the student multiple times to make him proud. Hey, your work is important. It's not just in a drawer somewhere. It's relevant for practice. And a couple of times he was always like, oh, okay, okay. And then he told me the fifth time, to be honest, I'm not sure if I should be happy about it because I'm not sure my data is good enough. Imagine that. So we're, we're still teaching our next generation that the data has to be so accurate, you have to be so secure to show it to someone for greater sense. For them, it doesn't matter at all if it's one or two degrees difference or five kilowatt or whatever, it doesn't matter at all. It's properly done, it's good enough. And so this notion is part of system sensing. Yes, we have to learn the method in, in detail to be really good and proficient in that method, but the method for a daily practical use might be very different. And that made me actually think a lot on um, these experiences. So, if we look at living systems, and this is in a living system, uh, this is the Venice bioregion, the Venice Lagoon, and uh, it is not only cell-based biology, living system, it's living, so it's defined by being cell-based cell, cell -based biology, um, but we as humans are included. And if you can see a human trace here, um, maybe someone sees humans in here, with sharp eyes, and a creative morning mind, any direct human influence? What do you see? On the water? No? <laughs> okay, well, let's see. We are so emergent here, and the moving is a bit good, so it's actually here. It's kayaks. So this is part of a, of a course we did to enact living systems and understand living systems, that we are part of it. We are living systems. Living systems are not those systems that we engineer. Every one of us is a living system. Every one of us has nanoplastic in their cells. And we all function similar in this way. So we're interconnected. It's not nature there, out there, and we are something else. No, we are nature by definition of a living system. So they are dynamic. We are dynamic, self-organizing, and emergent. And that's challenging our traditional paradigms of how we enact this. So um, a distinguished colleague of us, Johannes Jäger, has a really cool block, you can see it on the right side, it's also quite designerly and graphical. Um, and these three elements might help us to understand how living systems that are 
complex distinguished from non-living systems that are more complicated. Self-organization called autopoiesis. So living organisms self-manufacture while machines are manufactured. They boast evolution, so they construct themselves, they have purpose, which is continue to live. And machines are usually made by connecting, depending on the constructor's purpose. And they interact continuously, so they don't need fixing, they don't need a repair shop, they don't break unless we give them the, live, the conditions they need to thrive. So they want to live this kind of the autopoietic, sympoietic aspects in them. And that's fundamentally different to machines. And this emergence, um, part of chaos theory, chaos theory, is quite relevant. We show here the butterfly effect, where something very small might lead to high ripple effects in the system. So it might just that today you tap into that one person here, unplannable, randomly, and you have a talk, and this talk leads to you know, your new job, for example, or to a big project, or something else. So this tiny, tiny thing might have a ripple effect, and that's part of the emergence in systems. And that can be threatening. Yes, it's uncertain. It can go in the other direction, but it can also be beautiful. It gives us a lot of potential in these non-near systems. So the question is then how we can we shift from our more control-oriented way of enacting complicated systems to having this relational sensing as well. It's not one or the other, it's as well with the system sensing. So we need dynamic real-time feedback other than rigid control. We need to have different governance systems in here. Um, and we have a really cool opportunity um, that we can tap into this more in an emotional context based on, on neuroscience. And we're going to this in a bit. So the engineering part and the sensing part they sound a bit like dichotomies, and they are, but they're really integrated. And it's a kind of fluid one. Remember one of the terms in the beginning talked about the seamlessness integration of both parts. So let's look a moment at the building bridges part. Um, that is the topic of this conference. So I have three elements that relate to our journey from systems engineering to system sensing. And the first one is, yes, we build bridges. Structural bridges. Yes, that's the, maybe the first connection, but also human bridges. So we're seeing here some of our research on social networks, social systems. And this is a, a generic display of research on how communities, villages, organizations collaborate. The dots are people or organizations, the lines are relations, collaboration. And we have different structural properties in these networks. You can see the central actor, in, that, in the center, that's the, the personal organization steering and controlling. It's degree centrality, so it's most relations come together, meaning that actor is most important, most influence. But then we have many other functions. We have that small group on the left. Some of your company gets a kind of retreat space and they develop ideas without influence. But then we got to build a bridge through the broker or the gatekeeper to reconnect them to the system. And this sounds maybe very simple, but it's extremely important when we think about how do we intervene in system? How do we bring new ideas in a system? Where is the innovative space, the protected space for this to thrive? Where's the kind of building bridge connector that connects the kind of innovative cluster to the decision-making aspects? So the whole research part on complex systems and social network, and it's uh, very, very helpful to connect. Sometimes we also let bridges grow, and that's a bit the kind of, hey, don't engineer everything. We cannot, we cannot try to engineer it. We can try. And they self-repair. So they, they remain a living system. So sometimes we have to let go and let things a bit evolve, give it space and also sense where our natural energies. And that's not in our normal culture in this kind of Western scientific worldviews in the engineering context we live in. 
And sometimes the system may benefit from no bridges. So bridging doesn't always mean it's positive. Sometimes we got to stay out, like in this lagoon. This lagoon doesn't need any bridges. And I'm citing here from uh, a colleague, well, a colleague, he's more than a colleague, uh, he's by Akumalafe. We had in our program, that's why I mentioned colleague, but he's a very inspiring uh, He refers to when we have come to the end of the rope, to the very end of the world, and there are no more words. So when you somehow got stuck, when things no longer fit post-activism. And we use it a bit in the sense of post-activism, yeah, sometimes non-acting is a form of acting. Non-bridging, non-engineering, not rushing to the solution. Sometimes the systems, organic systems, Living system needs space and time to evolve, and we have to take the time to step back and embrace this complexity. The engineering mind is counterproductive in these systems sometimes, and this is quite a cultural step. So it's, it's really um, inspiring to follow back by, by Akumalafe. So this opening, this transition from systems engineering to system sensing in complicated, complex systems, that's a journey, a journey of, at the end, cultural opening, cultural change and an emotional aspect. And again, I want to stress that it's not either or. The systems engineering context remains, of course, important. It's adding something to it. It's infusing, it's enriching. So living systems, um, because of their emergent self-organization properties, they require different ways of enacting, of us enacting with them. And much goes back to emotional intelligence. So practice like empathy and like collective problem solving can be learned, can be studied. Emotional intelligence can be spurred. It's understanding feedback loops and the mirror neurons we have in our mind. They are part of our system that we can be more aware of. So it's a lot about metacognitively understanding our emotional adaptability. And we see that often in, in being trained in a more mechanistic, controlling, predictable way, we often lack this context to it, or have a resistance. Emotional intelligence is something soft, something not really tangible, it's hard to measure. So this bridge in here could be a personal mindset of growth, of opening up. We refer to it in uh, some of the, uh, the language learning, to unlearn, to relearn. But that's a big step because we have to question ourselves. And we're not used to do that. It's not comfortable. So practices like mindfulness, self-compassion, can help to strengthen this emotional acting and reacting by certain change in our brain structure, the prefrontal cortex. And I have another example from some of my teaching over the years, another master's student in the building system. So <laughs> this group came to this real-world lab in the Piemont, and the task was to develop a kind of systems understanding, a systemic design aspect of a very complex interwoven system of the valley, the mountain valley with all its mobility and buildings um, and people living there, um, and then the community, one village as part of that, zooming in of that valley. And we had three currencies, three types of flows to, to engineer, to, to map, to understand. That was the ecology green, carbon dioxide equivalence of flows. It was finances, money, and it was that, that symbol in reddish, and that's the oxygen culture, this local culture. And so they looked at different examples in here, from mobility to wood buildings, to land use, to artists, to um, forests, to mobility, and did a proper systems analysis. They, for example, um, wrote a code in Grasshopper to use spatial data of all the buildings in that valley, also the ruins, and try to understand what is the surface of the roofs, south facing, and the facades. How much energy could we uh, produce on these surfaces, depending on the season, 
August or July and, and December, and depending on the mountainscape, on the shadedness on the relief. So it's all computed. So it's like 60, 80 pages of, of, of math basically behind there. And then we made these synthesis maps. So these maps are designed to bring that kind of modeling, data modeling into a context that people can understand it. They are meant to be taken out to the people in the community, to tourists in Italian language, and make people think about systems, about relations, to engage them. Because if we engineer renewable mobility, we did that everywhere, there also. People don't take it for whatever reason. It's too complex. It's the human factor involved. And when we did this, one of the students said, we do systems, not graphics. I remember he was pissed <laughs> a bit, saying like, hey, come on, don't, don't, uh, don't um, torture me with uh, beautiful graphics, visuals, but I want to do, I want a calculation, I want to engineer. And we had a graphical artist coming in here. So that notion, I'm still thinking about it, we do system or graphics, this is systems. It's actually even the most important part, I would say, because all the math, the calculation that they did, never connected. For example, you see here, and I'm moving a bit, that's healthy. This is a, a proposed mini gondola, a recycled used gondola, mini gondola, small to bring people up and avoid all the traffic. We showed this to the former mayor and she hated gondolas. She had an emotional connection of gondolas in a big ski area. She said, no way, I'm 100% against it. So this was never displayed in the public because it hit a kind of emotional context. It was some years ago, it's more up to date than ever. This is awesome work by the students. Oh, perfect, great. So this emotional intelligence, this connection to ourself is critical to include in our understanding and relation with complexity. So there's a high need for emotional intelligence when dealing with uncertainty and complexity. And we can learn that, we can train it. That's the good news. So key elements of this awareness, self-awareness. Yes, I can zoom out of myself and see myself like from a drone view from, the, from above. I can see what I am doing right now and why. So I have the capacity of meta-reflexivity. Empathy, yes, I can sense, I can feel. It touches me, I can do something with it. Collaboration and adaptability. I'm flexible. I'm highly flexible. So these is skill sets we need to build. In addition, we need to teach, to train, to embody, and bring in our cultures. Otherwise, we will not proceed in dealing with the complexities that are increasingly interconnected and nested. Another of these experiences with some of the students, and I can say we're learning so much from each other. This is not top-down teaching. This is very collaborative learning from and with each other. And these are consecutive programs. So these are young master students. It's not like executives, like if we teach, uh, learn together. So the task in, in this course I gave was to de design a circular skateboard or kiteboard, a different activity um, tools that we built. So it's a systems engineering tool from regenerative materials. And the first thing obviously was thinking, yes, let's, fend, let's talk about biocomposites with hemp, with flux. Let's think about 3D printing and vacuum lamination, all these fancy cool uh, engineering tools and techniques, which are super helpful. But then the cool thing happens. So the course made him rethink his approach. Do I really need this kind of engineering to have a kind of circular skateboard? How am I actually using the skateboard? I'm, I'm him. It's not a, um, like a super skateboarder. He just uses it sometimes to cruise a bit to get some from the bakery in the morning. Just cruising a bit on the road, having some fun, coming back. So for that purpose, he doesn't need a super engineered, highly flexible composite material. He said, I can do it from hazelnut sticks in the garden of my parents. So he went back, he just, there were some dry sticks, he just cut them. Um, he had like, I oh know, you can see it there, five or six or seven sticks. He threw them together and he had some used wheel sets from his childhood. So he came up with this one while the others were doing a CAD program. They had um, biocomposites, 
vacuum lamination, um, some laser engravement. So learning also the methods, obviously. So both approaches were super cool, but this one surprised me completely. And so, yeah, emotion intelligence, zooming a bit out, it doesn't always have to be that one. Sometimes something very simple or different can lead to a sufficient result and even have so-called side effects in the system. So what this student taught me, us, in this case, his kind of mind switch, is some kind of, yeah, emotional intelligence that, that we can train. So it's not only IQ, it's also EQ, and we can, we can practice the EQ. And it's, um, it's, it's based on hard science, hard evidence from neuroscience. And I have one source, um, if you're interested in here, um, so these repetitive, certain repetitive practices lead to measurable change in our brain function. And it can help us to enhance our emotional collaborative potential also in stress situations and our in problem solving environments. So we need these capacities and we can train and learn them. It's shown. Another example, transforming the same mobility system that I showed you before, the valley and the kind of energy and flow modeling, this was even done before um, to understand what could be a different mobility in the system that gets overcrowded by over-tourism, especially on weekends. And we did this mobility study with students. We asked people, can you leave your car here? Do you want to step over to have like an electric van to bring you up? Um, you get a certain gimmick, uh, you have a questionnaire. And so on. we did that twice, 17, 18, and we published it in Tel language. And it's, it's a choice experiment. It's proper science and proper engineering of the system because we proposed already what needed. And we, we did it. We experimented. It never flew. It never flew. The community, the municipality picked up some elements of it some years later. But this work, the students never really got the credit. So the data is there since years. Um, but the emotional coherence was difficult. It was too far away from the local culture. And it was also done in the kind of students and academics. And it was, yeah, despite of being transdisciplinary, it just didn't blossom. So hands are bound. It's frustrating. And more data, better data, more engineering doesn't help. But it helps to reconnect and see what are the kind of sub factors. How do I connect better differently with the local culture, the people, to make it there. And maybe it takes time. So maybe it takes not bridging for a while. It just takes time. And yes, here it takes time. Now it's coming out six years later or so. So something just touching briefly on um, evolving work and governance styles. Yes, with this kind of opening to be more organic, to be more emergence to allow for things to happen, to be more adaptive. We also have to change, not our inner cultures only, but the way we work, the way we govern, the way we control ourselves, our people. We have to give more space. And it's not for everyone. I'm not saying one is better than the other, but we need both. So creatives, if I'm told to write a paper right now, it might not work. I usually do it at night between 11 in the evening, one in the morning. I wrote my PhD at that time. That's my natural capacity to be creative. So we need to people give people this space in certain parts. And so different ways of um, allowing this feedback loop culture and allowing emotional intelligence to thrive, including learning through failure. It's a different culture. And obviously, we cannot allow failure in certain safety issues. Right? There's, of course, a limit for this kind of organicity. That's very clear. I think that's the last example from this kind of Mon Visa Institute teaching. Comp uh, um, coined by Tich Nhat Hanh. Um, is, is like in simple words that we are part of it. It's all interconnected and everything is interconnected. So we cannot separate it really. And so um, the student said, well, um, in this Alpine Urban Resilience School, 
um, the notion that we were there asking questions, showing interest in the culture, showed up to be more important than the actual topic of alpine urban resilience and the kind of content, cognitive discussions. The notion that this group came and the groups come over time builds excitement and trust in local people. They're coming because they're interested, they're not coming for money or just no children, they're coming to learn from us. Disciplinary, remember, is different from inter and cross disciplinary. Transdisciplinary means science from and with practice. It's more than collaborating between different knowledge types. It's infused and stimulated by practice. And this relates to adaptive cultures that value learning, experimentation, also failure. And at the end, it will make us more resilient, also our teams, our projects, and complexity. So a quick notion on AI. Much of the images in here, like this one, are generated with Dalla A3, ChatGPT. Uh, yeah, and it helps us, obviously. I mean, AI helps us. It's totally helpful in many ways. It helps us to enact complexity of certain types or complicatedness. But it's also very clear to say it's for sure not enough. And it needs the human intelligence factor, empathy, emotional, cultural complexities how we enact together and also our inner processes. So an example is city mobility transition project. We can model the perfect mobility theoretically for a city. But if we don't integrate certain cultural groups and if we don't understand that certain pathways are very, are very emotionally connected to some people cycling every day, we just close it, we lose those people. It's just one simple example. AI supports, yes, totally, it's not the solution. So the last part, I want to go a bit into this term of systemic design because there is something how we can bridge systems engineering with system sensing. And again, it's not neither nor, either or, it's both. And this is latest work um, and it's highly complicated, so I don't want to go too deep, but this is from uh, our group at uh, ETH, Systemic Design Labs, and this is a core of the new course in systemic design, where you see us in the middle, in the center. We are in the center, not that system there. We are the system and part of it. And we ask ourselves questions. How do we navigate in context of a complex challenge, complex challenges that are continuously changing and moving? And what type of types of inquiry do we use? We need engineering types of data. We need quantitative science. We need soft social science. We need designerly ways of enacting, of iterating and doing research by design. We also need embodied practices, experiences, and we need inner processes. They all come together. And usually we train either or. Systems, more complex, more data. Right? No, it needs all of these. And we have to ask ourselves, um, what is the relational value of different types of inquiry? and we are intrinsic part of it. So that's a new way to train ourselves. Emotional intelligence is an element of it. So this is a core, and you see the term of organic emergence that comes up again and in the beginning. So I mentioned also some more rigid frameworks in the beginning that we, we in engineering, we use. This is a, another type of framework. It's a complexity framework, and you see here eight nested scales, nested, interconnected, of governance of decision-making from green chemistry such as carbon dioxide equivalents of processes or materials or nutrients, all the way to transnational cooperation. And eight scales in this one, in this red kind of Fibonacci spiral context, are nested with other spirals. And each of these decision-making scales has a dashed circle. It stands for different types of circularities. Material, circular economy, materials, finances, water, carbon equivalent slash energy and social circularities. So it's a highly complex internested, interconnected framework that's adaptive and moves. And we use this in our training, in our work to show how, where can we start in very complex systems? It's overwhelming. But if we are, for example, systems engineers 
on a city scale, we use uh, scale number five, community citizen services, and we work with the complexities on that scale. But we learn to continuously zoom in, zoom out, because every decision on that scale relates to all the other scales continuously. And it's different to what we normally learn. It's a continuously hoggling between system scales. And this gets even more messy, so it's fascinating. We don't go deep in this, but it's also a very um, recent work in progress of our group here. Um, and we have the graphical designer actually sitting here. <laughs> so this is um, yeah, very different work. And it takes this wobbly system that we had in the beginning, and the question, the goal is how to intervene in complex system. It's not engineering them, it's not solutions, it's intervening, it's becoming part of it. So activating a system with multiple tools in marks from many directions and times. And so it's a whole aspect um, of where we can dive in deeper and learn from. And last one of this, in respect for time, um, this is also kind of bridging element, a bridging between the organicity of the fuzziness of emergence, and yes, we have to learn to adopt our cultures, to a kind of framework that is useful to work with companies. And it's based on this journey here, homework performance art. Homework is what we need to do right now due to legal aspects or safety or to survival rules. Performance is the next step. So if we do a carbon equivalent emission report, for example, that is on the brink of becoming standard homework legally, European-wide, but still mostly performance. So we can do it. We don't have to, but it makes sense as a decision-making support tool. And the art is something where resilience, our adaptive transformative capacity are the, the most stable. And that's the kind of preparation for a future to come, regenerative, more than sustainable. It's being in flow, being in relation with systems. And the side engagement is at the homework part rather low. It increases heavily with the performance because that's the big step we have to take. And it somehow levels out in the art. And so the same three elements you can see here on this chart, homework performance art, and on the left side, different criteria, ESG criteria, but also kind of systemic criteria in there. That's a kind of rigid matrix, has columns and lines, but the cells, they are highly adaptive. So they move depending on the context, on the company, on the time, on the situation. So we can use a kind of envelope that helps us to structure and helps us to navigate where are we right now, so if one company asks me, we're not sure if we should do a life cycle assessment, uh, then we can say, well, um, let's take a look at this. Life cycle assessment, given your context, is performance. You don't have to do it. So don't put your money right now here, put it somewhere else. That's more homework. But be prepared that it will become standard at some point. So it helps to navigate on the journey. So these are very concrete ones. And uh, to close this off, we can learn it. Um, we have this program at ETH designing resilient regenerative systems, and we have engineers in our program, and we have uh, one uh, of our classmates here as well, with a PhD in engineering um, and being in this program. So um, we're happy uh, to have these connections. And so this program consists of all sorts of the language is more living system types. It's the tree with four massive open online courses up there. They are free. So in a certificate, it costs $50. Um, and the root system is the executive program. So we offer it for free, the main content, but the working together, including free design trips, including this real world labs, is through three certificate of advanced studies and the master of advanced studies. This is made for professionals like us. And the topics, um, it's interwoven, obviously. It's highly complex. We have these elements. The first one, sustainability to regeneration, this journey of opening up to learn, to unlearn, to relearn. What is the difference? There's a big difference. Our own worldviews. So it's the opening up part, the journey. Then the beyond system thinking, meta-awareness, system thinking tools. We'll talk about this a lot in this course. Next one is systemic design that comes up now. And that's about this navigation in all these types of inquiry. And last one is then the um, transformative praxis. And you can see the different learning curves. And we take care of this term, organic emergence. And here it comes again. I mentioned at the beginning, the inner capacity 
to befriend uncertainty. And inner capacity means my own feeling safe, my own skills, but also me embedded in society and my groups, my friends, my network, my colleagues, my family. So I feel safe to confront what's not known. Usually it makes us uh, being scared. We can train it. Um, yeah, wrapping it up. So we can learn this metacognitively, a metacognitive process about our own roles, our own worldviews, how we were trained, how we work, how we see complicated versus complex systems. We can acquire tools, practices. Emotional intelligence is an important element, and it's not, uh, it's all based on neuroscience in this case, so it's nothing um, fuzzy. It can be measured, these effects. Um, and we can implement elements like feedback loops, like dealing with emergence. But we need different governance system. We need to open the cultural constraint and start with ourselves asking questions and sensing our own practices. So um, I want to do this one first here. And um, I would like to share it also. Well, this is an offer of living the question of asking ourselves questions, not about I know how it works, it's about opening up and asking ourselves these questions and other questions. How do we balance the desire for control with the need for adaptability? How does governance and system engineering fields need to evolve to keep up with these complexities? And how do I open up myself? Yes, we're done. And maybe um, I can ask you to do this one again here. I hope this works. I'm not sure why this doesn't work. Let me see. I kick this out just to finish this off. Found it out. Um, where's the next one? Is it this one? Yeah. So this should work now. If you scan again, um, this one here, I think you should get to it. And the question is now, what presented terms, keywords, concepts describe or trigger you? Maybe something is we're really not d'accord with. Or something puts on you where I think like, ah, oh, I'm going to ask myself no more questions. <laughs> so let's see if that becomes visible here in our, here we go. Good enough. Cool. Yeah, feel your feelings. Oh. Um, organic immersion, that's such a cool term, isn't it? <laughs> uh, ready to scale, cross scales, zoom in, zoom out. Human in the loop. Rethink. Inclusive. So yeah, keep posting. Thank you very much um, for uh, yeah, journey, joining this journey. And uh, I'm really curious. Tobias, thank you very much for such an inspiring speech. Um, I mean, just challenging us really to expand our field of view. And because at the end of the day, anything that we are building, we are building it by people, for people. So for me, I found it incredible. Thank you very much. I think we have um, maybe two or three minutes to take one or two questions. It's experimenting. It doesn't have to be an important question. Any question is good. Somebody's just to start. Here we go. Start. Yeah, maybe uh, you in the back. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to say that I find this. World scale issues like, for example, climate change. Um, I think that we have been focusing on engineering many solutions without thinking of uh, our environment and the consequences and the context. And I think it is very, um, I don't know, um, I don't know when we 
uh, have our box, as you said, like an in, also in the pictures. Um, and then we think when we think beyond and with emotional intelligence, when thinking about uh, the environment and uh, also the orga organic emergence, probably even climate change was an organic emergence of our actions. No, um, so I don't know. I I really like this. Uh, uh, I don't know this. Uh, new new thinking. Um, maybe could you tell us a bit about uh, your journey or how? And it's extremely difficult to implement these thoughts and these practices into us and our societies, into oneself and our systems. Building up this program at ETH is extremely difficult. It's bringing this organicity in and opening the system from within, living that kind of governance change. It uh, involves something that's, again, not my, my words, but finding the cracks, jumping cracks to cracks. It's a lot of certain that one person that trusts you in that moment, your idea, and gives you an opportunity so you can come in. But at that moment, it's pretty clear there's no way further. And that requires that building high frustration tolerance, having a high um, yeah, organic immersion at the end, inner capacities to trust it, to say, well, I believe in it. I sense the system that we work towards this opening. It's totally clear. It's, 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 it's totally clear. It's not a question anymore, but it's difficult. It's against our notes. So how can we withstand? And one thing is, yeah, time, feeling safe. I mean, to do these kind of things, we need to be in a state where we don't feel threatened healthy, paying our bills, having food, and having no war. So that's, uh, you know, and, and most of us maybe have this luck. Uh, and then it requires building these inner tools. And for me, that comes a lot from mountaineering. I work as a mountain guide half of my life. And so having these experiences of being beyond the comfort zone alone, but also taking people beyond the comfort zone, where 10 centimeters can decide between life and death, literally. And bring that back safely, that's uh, to me the, the most powerful tool I know to build this organic emergence. If I experience stepping out of my comfort zone in the learning or close the panic zone and coming back safely through the group containment, it creates kind of flow experiences and I can transform this into the other way. So that's part of um, having even fun to deal with uncertainty. But again, as soon as we, let's say, get unemployed and have no bills to pay, we have to acknowledge that this might affect our safety feeling a lot. So we have to make sure that this kind of safety context is there. Thanks very much, Tobias. Um, yeah, we need to continue with the, with the schedule of the day, Tobias, uh, but I know there are many more questions. Um, Tobias will be with us um, during coffee breaks and also at the APRO. So. Then let's continue. Thank you very cool, much. Thank you. Yeah.